uh, that covers a multitude of sins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sure does. Um, the, the North Florida, to be exact, Jacksonville area. Jacksonville. Ah, yes. And there are a couple of times. Everyone has the perception. Palm trees, beaches, you got it. <laughs> I, I, I've been there a couple of times and actually found a beach. It wasn't uh, much of a beach, but it was a beach. Uh, of course, it wasn't. That's no reflection on Jacksonville. That's a reflection on me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know where the heck I was going, but somehow I wandered out of a, a, a street and ended up at, uh, at sand and stuff. So. <laughs> there's there's one thing definitely about, yeah, about Florida. It, if you drive far enough east, you will hit a beach. And the good thing about Florida, if you drive far enough west, you'll also hit a beach. <laughs> if you drive far enough south, you'll hit a beach. And if you drive definitely. far enough north, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Actually, you won't. You'll you'll ultimately get to where I am. I'm I'm in the Boston. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, my my brother and his well his wife went to uh, WPI up there. Ah, okay. About uh, 30 miles west of us. So. But, uh, far enough that they've had 20 more inches of snow than we've had. <laughs> yeah. What do, so, what Robin, do you what do when, the, Yeah, go I, ahead. I was going to say, what uh, what company are you with right now? This might be part of your presentation. I don't want to to jump it or anything, but uh, are you are you are you full time at a company somewhere? Are you mainly doing consulting or? Well, the answer okay. to both is yes. In that, I've I've had my own company since 1982. It's called GoPro Management okay. Incorporated. Um, Recently, in the more recent years, people get all excited, thinking that it's the, uh, the camera company. And I'm, you know, every once in a while, I'll get a I'll get a customer service email. You know, my camera does this or whatever, and I have to tell them that uh, that we're the uh, that we've been GoPro for a lot longer than the camera guys have. <laughs> but we're a consulting and training firm. Excellent. That's great. And so the name itself, uh, what was what was the mindset behind the name? Helping helping people to become more professional, or well, that's a great was, name. That was a part of it. My first, my last name is Goldsmith, so, so. Ah. and uh, you know, and, uh, once upon a time, I did a lot of programming as well, but uh, that's. Uh, no longer, no longer an issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's interesting. You know, I think it would be interesting to to survey the kind of larger agile community and those who have embraced the idea of being an agile coach or a scrum master or some of the like, and kind of see what the percentages of those who came from a project management background, those who came from a development background, or who came from some other area, you know, and a, a role that maybe doesn't fit one of those two. I'd be interested to see uh, where where most people uh, start their journey as they as they explore this space. Well, that, uh, you know, certainly would be interesting. My suspicion is at this point in, in the life of Agile that most of the people in Agile don't have a prior life. <laughs> Oh, I mean, it's been around yeah. for 16, 17, 18 years, whatever it is now. So that's true. Depending upon when you count the beginning. There are, yeah, there are a lot of career agilists to this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. We, we did that. That is awesome. Um, what, what was it? It was the career path tool. And, yeah, mine was all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do now, Jeff? Well, I, right now I'm just a scrum master for a team, but I'm getting more back into project management in, in a traditional sense with another project I in, inherited. And uh, before this, I was actually at, at the head of kind of what you would call like product 
uh, project management organization, the PMO, in, in cultivating and refining and building an agile culture model at a company. Oh, Before that, I've been into color science and color theory, um, newspaper printing and advertising, quality assurance, um, graphic arts, web development. <laughs> no, no good deed goes unpunished. Look, looks to me like it's yeah. it's five after here. We better. That's right. You got it. It's yeah. three o five, or well, three o five where I'm coming from. Five past. Hopefully, everybody is. Um, gathered and welcome to everyone. We're going to go ahead and get ourselves kicked off here. It's Isaac right now with Jeff as your host. Robin's our special guest today. We're going to go ahead and get going on this journey as we move forward. So our agenda, our timeline as we go forward, is going to be uh, five minutes to join the call. That's expired. We're into that kickoff section right now with a quick glance of who and how many are with us and what we're all about here. And so at the moment, we've got, it looks like 25 people, and that's been growing over the past few minutes. So we expect a few more to join us. So welcome to everyone who's joining us. If you get a chance, introduce yourself in the chat window there of the WebEx, just the name and where you're from. Uh, it would be excellent to get to know you. Also, I want to draw your attention to the Q&A panel. So in WebEx, there's a little panel you can switch over to that allows you to ask a question. Jeff and I here in a minute, when we hand the ball over to Robin and he takes over talking, we are going to be in the background. We'll collect those questions and we'll be coming back on and hopefully Heidi will join us towards the end, we'll come back and we'll have some of those questions hopefully answered by Robin there at the end. So as we go through the presentation, make sure to take advantage of that Q&A panel. So I see a few people introducing yourselves. Welcome, glad you guys are here. Wow, it's several people from one, that's fantastic. All right, so we are gonna keep moving forward. Coaching Agile Journeys is a group committed to living our Agile journey to the fullest. I was just talking with Robin about what we're doing here. It's just a group of people who are interested in seeing where our Agile journey takes us and getting on that road with fellow and like-minded Agilists. So welcome to all of you. We're dedicated to finding highly focused topics that help escalate the development of our individual Agile coaching journeys. We are, of course, interested in transparency inspection and ad adaptation or adaption. And our goal is to find topics that Agile coaches will uh, be able to grow through. So that's what we're about here. Your hosts for this are Heidi, Isaac and Jeff, I'm Isaac, Jeff's here, and Heidi should be joining us. If you have any questions or want to connect with us, coachingagilejourneys.com is our website, and uh, we'd love to connect with you there. If you have any ideas for future topics, want to be a future speaker, do reach out to one of us, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So we are now, I have a slide here. We normally send a kind of quote of the day. I grabbed a Henry Ford classic here, which is, but you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So that's from Henry Ford and just something to think about as you move forward on your day. We'll actually go ahead and give Robin about a minute and a half extra time. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the ball your direction, Robin, as we switch into our main topic. And you'll be sharing with us as you get up and going, requirements are simply requirements, or maybe not. And so I'm gonna go dark and, and once you get up and running, we'll just let you have the ball and, and take the stage. Now I'm gonna have to fiddle here for a second, and okay. whoops. Um, I love it okay. when you start the WebEx, it jumps somewhere else. <laughs> well, it's all yours, sir. Can you see, whoops, let's see. Can you see my screen, everybody? Yes, sir. We, yes. Okay, well, great. Well, as, as I uh, welcome everybody, Thank you for having me. As I uh, was mentioning uh, with Isaac, I'm located in the Northeast. Uh, we've actually been having uh, not quite as warm. Uh, pardon me for this. I've been trying to create a backup disk and it took forever and of course it always interrupts. Um, so. I'm I'm in the Boston area. We've had decent weather, uh, relatively little snow, thank goodness, and uh, and enough of that. So let me let me share with you uh, a little bit about this talk. So let me go back. Um, this is a presentation that I made uh, several times at the Better Software and Agile Development Conference. Some of you may be con uh, aware of that. Uh, and 
as as so often happens, uh, I was sitting at the keynote session next to this young woman, and we got talking, and uh, it turned out that it was Heidi, and uh, she and I were both presenting at the same time, so we couldn't hear each other's presentations, and uh, so she invited me to listen to hers a month or two ago, and uh, uh, present mine now, so that we each get a chance to hear what the other said. So. Um, the origin of this talk was that I had been to a conference uh, where I heard a lot of supposed agile experts um, talking, among other things, about user stories and, and requirements and so forth. And what I found was two things. One was that they were totally inconsistent with each other, and the other was that an awful lot of what a lot of them said didn't seem real accurate to me. And so I put together this presentation to kind of uh, come at this in a little bit different way, not picking on uh, them in particular, but trying to uh, uh, present a more even uh, uh, presentation, contrasting some of the common uses of terms. I want to introduce to you what I call real business requirements. Those are business deliverable what's that provide value when met. And relate all that to a couple of tips that I hope you will find helpful for avoiding uh, traps, not just in agile, but in, in all requirements definition. And I'll just give you a caveat that I've had to carve this presentation down considerably from an hour's presentation uh, at the, the Better Software Conference. And um, so I'm going to be going as fast as I can. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to uh, confuse you too much, uh, but we'll try and uh, uh, use uh, the question and answers, uh, hold them, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, until the end. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the Mike Cohn, uh, uh, yeah, as a such and such, I want such and such so that I can get something or another. Uh, and generally requirements in Agile tend to be considered user stories, user stories tend to be considered requirements. Okay, and then it gets more confusing because then we we bring in this concept of backlogs, product backlogs, sprint backlogs, release backlogs. And so what are we talking about? Something that can be small enough to be accomplished within a sprint. And typically that involves some grooming and refining and splitting. And now we start getting confused because some people will refer to the backlog items as backlog items, some refer to them as features, some refer to them as user stories, and then who knows what else people have in there or, or uh, call them. And so I don't know about you, but I've found that this is one of the places where people start uh, getting confusing and possibly confused. And then there's this other thing, the, the CCC, the concept that the user's story is on the front of an index card, the confirmation or acceptance criteria and, and tests uh, for the user's story are on the back of the card. And then this term placeholder, a reminder for a conversation. And once again, I think that that, you know, creates a, a a big opportunity for people interpreting that in a million ways and thinking that everybody understands it the same way they do. So we've got the conversation in the middle that leads to working code, which should be satisfying the user story acceptance tests and ending up delivering what it is that the, the customer or the product owner or whomever wants uh, and uh, provides the desired benefit. That's the theory. That 
somehow or another, from what people tell me, uh, doesn't always work out exactly that way. And perhaps some of you are familiar with that concept. So in my travels and analysis, I've found that there are a number of issues with user stories and, and as requirements, and many of those issues exist but may not be well recognized. Uh, a lot of people uh, share that they have difficulty writing them appropriately, but there are probably many more that are written inappropriately that people uh, really don't recognize. And the problem is that grooming and splitting inappropriate user stories probably isn't going to result in making them any more appropriate. I think there's a continual danger of proliferation of some trivia, and I think that that, that can get in people's ways. Um, I think that people mistakenly assume that a user's story is accurate uh, because generally when a product owner says, here's the user's story, um, I don't think a lot of project teams really challenge whether it, the user's story is right. They may make it into some aspects of it. Is it clear but right? That's a different issue. Similarly, I think that user story acceptance tests and user story acceptance criteria are helpful, but frankly, there's a good chance that they're not nearly as adequate as they ought to be. And I think that throughout, there is an issue of people following models which either are misunderstood or mistaken or both. And one of those I'm going to emphasize especially, we're talking about the difference between real, what I call real business requirements versus product requirements. And we'll look at that. And then the other is this issue of developer conversations. And I'm not going to get into that because I really can't deal with your particulars, but I think you've got to ask yourself, how legitimate is it, how reliable is it to assume that the developers in their conversations are in fact capable of performing uh, suitable and necessary analysis? You know, trained, specialized business analysts have a great deal of difficulty unearthing what needs to be done, and that tends not to be the strength of most developers. And I think leaving it to the developers really opens us to uh, potential for uh, things not being the way they need to be and no, really not having a good way to tell it. But I want to focus on user stories and and the relation to uh, the real business requirements and the product requirements. So here's an example of a user story as a filling station attendant. I want a gas pump so I can pump gas. And perhaps you've seen user stories like this. I certainly have including ones, as I said, that were offered by supposed authorities. Now, I would contend that there are a number of issues with this user story and similar ones. And I'm not going to get into what those issues are now, but if you have any thoughts, uh, maybe you can chat them or Q&A them, whatever the uh, box is that you're typing in, if you see any issues with this as a user story. I'm just going to push forward. This is the price of not having the extra half hour. Okay. Similarly, these might be some uh, user story acceptance criteria for that gas pump user story. Okay. Same question. Okay. Are there any issues with these? 
Okay. If there are anything that you sense, um, please share with us, and uh, we'll pick that up uh, at the end if we have time. Okay. Um, some of you may be familiar with the International Institute for Business Analysis. They have the business analysis body of knowledge and related uh, certifications. And in some ways, Bambach uh, institutionalizes a lot of conventional practices. And sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes I think it actually is a source uh, part of the problem. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues that I see is that elicitation, uh, Babak doesn't say it should be a passive activity, but Babak doesn't say it shouldn't be. And so in my experience, very often, elicitation is simply taking dictation. What do you want? write it down. And I think that that often happens uh, with regard to user stories. Now, in Babok, they make a distinction between what are business objectives, and that is absolutely described as a passive dictation, just let the senior executive spout them. Okay, And then the more um, involved part of requirements uh, definition tends to be dealing with the, the people who are more directly involved with the product system or software. And it's largely tell me about the features that you want. And um, I think you can identify that a lot of uh, user stories are talking about features. Okay, now. I wrote an article called Should Babak Include Shorthand? Uh, ironically, uh, I published that on a requirements in a, uh, uh, networking group uh, which went out of business and then a, uh, a vendor agreed to host the article and they went out of business. So I'm still in business. If you want a copy of that article, just send me an email. And back in Babok, analysis tends to focus on analysis of the product system or software being created. And I would contend that Babok and its associated activities helps, but by no means has, has done a whole lot to eliminate creep and in my experience, it's still pretty common for creep changes to requirements to be blamed on users. The old users don't know what they want, I think, is still pretty true. And even if we you know, talk about uh, you know, how closely we work with users in, a, in an agile environment, I think that sometimes people have still been known to say the users don't know what they want, which may or may not be true. Now, let me suggest that we look at this in a different way. So I'm going to make a contrast between two types of requirements, business or user or customer or stakeholder requirements. And I use those terms interchangeably in product, system, or software requirements. And I use those terms interchangeably. And I know some of you make big distinctions between system and software requirements, depending upon whether hardware is involved. For these purposes, that distinction is really not relevant. So business requirements are from the perspective of and in the language of the business, the user, the stakeholder, or the customer. They are conceptual and they exist within the business environment. Business requirements are what's. What's that provide value when they are satisfied or delivered or met. They provide value by serving business objectives, solving business needs, solving problems, taking opportunities, meeting challenges. 
Now, I would guess that that's probably pretty similar to what most of you would mean by requirements. And what I want you to realize is that there are generally many possible ways to accomplish the business requirements. Product, system, software requirements represent a human-defined product or system, which is presumably one of those many possible ways, presumably how to presumably accomplish the presumed business requirements. Perhaps you noticed that the word presumed was emphasized. That's because products are generally based upon a lot of presumptions. And presumptions have a way of being wrong. And the more that we presume, the more wrong we are likely to be. These, by the way, are also often referred to as functional specifications or functional requirements, and then along with that it goes non-functional. Now, what I want you to realize is that when most people talk about requirements, in, and when I say most people, I'm including most of the books on requirements and most of the courses on requirements, and uh, probably what you and your colleagues mean when you say requirements. You're probably talking about requirements of the product, system, or software that you're expecting to create. Now, that's not wrong. It's just not the full story, because products by themselves provide no value. A product provides value only to the extent that it satisfies a real business requirement on the left. And in my experience, when I look at this in a different way, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is that creep occurs because requirements meaning the product requirements on the right are not sufficiently clear or testable. Sure, some of you have heard that. But in fact, when we look at it in a different way, what I find is that much of creep occurs because the product requirements, regardless of how clear and testable they are, turn out not to satisfy the real business requirements on the left. And the primary reason why the product requirements on the right don't satisfy the real business requirements on the left is because the real business requirements on the left have not been defined adequately. And the primary reason why the real business requirements on the left have not been defined adequately is because conventional wisdom says that the product requirements on the right are the requirements. And perhaps you can identify with that. Now, to be fair, the term business requirements or something similar is often used and very often in what I refer to as the levels model of requirements. Many of you may be familiar with this. So according to the levels model of requirements, business requirements are high level and vague and decompose into product or system or software requirements, which are detailed. Okay. And so according to the levels model, the difference between business requirements and product requirements is simply a level of detail. And by the way, you'll notice that Babock um, pretty much adopts this and says business requirements are statements of goals and objectives, high level vague stuff. Okay. Well, hopefully you can see why this widely accepted levels model cannot help but create creep because business requirements are what's. Product requirements are hows. What's do not decompose into how. Rather, how is a response to the what's. 
All the detail in the world on the how won't make up for the fact that you don't know the what. So the key to reducing creep is to realize that business requirements are not just high level and vague, but need to be driven down to more detail. And no matter how far down in detail you drive business requirements, they are always business deliverable what's that when delivered contribute to providing value. Driving them down to detail never turns them into a product, but driving them down to detail makes it much easier and more reliable to map a product to the product how to the business requirements deliverable what's that provide value. And that's really the key to reducing creep. And we'll see how that relates back to user stories momentarily. So when we look at this as a process, Stakeholders, and that's an all-inclusive term, are the ones that have the needs, the problems, the value to be obtained. Through a process of discovery and analysis, integrated elicitation and analysis, okay, we end up discovering both high level and then driving that down to more detail selectively, the real business or stakeholder or customer requirements, okay, which are also user requirements. These are the business deliverable what's that provide value when they are met. And that's an interactive process, an iterative process. And then we identify a product, system, software, its requirements, which are features, ways how to respond to satisfying the real business requirements, deliverable what's that provide value. And many people split uh, product requirements into functional requirements, including use cases. And by the way, the traditional uh, definition of use cases, or, or people conventionally feel that use cases are user requirements. In fact, use cases can be user requirements but almost always are usage requirements of an expected product system software feature or design. And then there are also software requirements, specifications, the system shell statements, and then non-functional requirements go along with that. And I'll just as an aside, encourage you not to use that term because it's misleading. Use other terms like quality factors or quality attributes or illities. Now, the product is what gets built, and it gets built by developing high level and then more detailed technical and engineering design, and that's actually what gets coded. So what's coded, what's built is the product, and if the product is right, it will satisfy the real business requirements and thereby provide value. Now hopefully this is an understandable process because here's our friend user stories. User stories should be representing real business requirements. Okay. That's, their, that's their intention. That's, that's the whole premise of delivering value. And then Here's our old friend conversations that lead to the code and tend to bypass a whole lot of this other stuff. And I ask, what could possibly go wrong? Well, you can answer that for yourselves. Okay. Now, I want to introduce to you a very powerful tool called the Problem Pyramid. And once again, we're not going to have a chance to get into this in quite the depth that is more helpful in understanding it, but hopefully uh, you'll get a, a good inkling of it. So the problem pyramid is a systematic, disciplined way to get to the real requirements. And there are six steps or numbered boxes that need to be performed 
in the numbered sequence. And I think you'll see why in a second. So we start by identifying the problem or opportunity or challenge. That's what's going to provide value when it's addressed adequately. And by the way, an opportunity is a chance to solve somebody else's problem. A challenge is a form of a problem. Now, would it surprise you to know that if the problem is not identified properly, you have very little chance of getting the solution correct? What might be more surprising to you is how hard it is to get the problem right, and that people tend not to realize this, and so they go off solving the wrong problem or not solving the right problem, and ultimately that's going to turn into other difficulties. Part of defining the problem correctly is identifying measures of the problem, and we have two types of measures. We have measures of the problem now that tell us it is a problem, and then we have goal measures that tell us the problem has been solved, the opportunity has been taken, the challenge has been met. Achieving the goal measures, solving the problem, is where the value comes from. Value comes from solving the problem, taking the opportunity, meeting the challenge, not from what you build. Okay. Now, when we solve a problem, we don't solve a problem directly. We solve a problem by identifying the cause or causes, what's known in the process world as the as-is process or current state. Notice that box four causes are what is producing the box two current measures that tell us we've got the problem. And we solve it by identifying Box five, the should be's, the business deliverable what's that when delivered will reasonably achieve the box three goal measures and thereby provide us the benefit or value. Box five are the real business requirements. What we build is box six, the how, a specific way that the box five should be's can be delivered or satisfied. Okay. Now, if you think back to how most projects work, which box do people tend to start with? Okay. And you can put that in your uh, chat, see if that, uh, see if we get a little bit of agreement as we go forward. Uh, I want to share with you an example of how this works. So this was an example that uh, was provided by a student in one of my requirements uh, seminars. And uh, this particular student uh, worked for a global financial services organization. And she was responsible for what is called the reuse repository. And uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with reuse repositories. That's where you put things so that they can be reused and thereby save uh, time and effort and, and typically also help you in improve quality. So this woman was responsible for the reuse repository for this global financial services organization. And she said her problem was that reuse data were not globally accessible, that there were a certain number of people that don't have access, and her goal measure was that all people have access. And she said that there were two reasons why uh, people were not getting access. There were some people that were using standalone PCs, and the company had an intranet, but it wasn't well developed, and so it wasn't really helping people get access to the reuse repository. And her should be was give everyone access via the web and intranet. And um, so I hope that that's reasonably understandable, maybe even be familiar, a familiar type of situation for some of us. And. Uh, I think you'd also agree that that leads to a pretty obvious project. Now, 
it turns out that problem pyramids are a lot harder to do than they look. And one of the things that we do with the problem pyramid is that we have some systematic or some guidelines for systematically evaluating each box as we do it so that we, we make more concerted and systematic efforts to make sure the problem is right before we get to the measures of it. And then if the measures don't fit the problem, that's another indicator that the problem is wrong or the measures are wrong or often both of them are wrong. So we're using uh, checks and then we're checking to make sure that the causes actually uh, are causing the problem and that we haven't overlooked anything. And then that the should be is in fact business deliverable what that when delivered will reasonably achieve the goal measures and thereby provide the value. So when we look at that uh, reuse data, uh, uh, the repository thing, the reuse data are not globally accessible sounds like a problem. And the number of people that do and do not have access indeed are measures of global accessibility. But maybe you can answer the question in the chat box again. If all people have access, does that by itself provide any real value? And if not, why not? So you can you can think about that and write your answers, but I'm going to head forward and suggest that the answer is that simply having access is not where the value comes from. That the value in a reuse repository comes from actually reusing things beneficially. And so the problem needs to deal with where they're not getting the value, with not actually reusing things. And that means that data not being globally accessible is not the problem, but is rather a cause of the problem. And there are probably some additional causes of why people are not reusing things such as they don't know what's there, they don't know how to reuse it, maybe there's nothing there for them to reuse, maybe they don't like reusing stuff that other people have. And then give everyone access via the web and internet. Well, I would suggest to you that that's not a what, that's a how. And in fact, give everyone access and all people have access is simply restating the goal. And so that obvious project think you can see almost certainly is going to be a failure. It is not going to provide the, the value that people want and need. But it will tie up people on projects and reduce the time and resources available for actually solving the real problem. So when we look at this uh, and revise that, we're not reusing to advantage, and by the way, Advantage is a critical part of that because just reusing for its own sake won't provide us any value. And the measures are, the, for instance, the low current percentage of reuse causing us to spend a certain amount of time and money to build systems. Goal measures a higher percentage of reuse that enables us to spend less time and less money building systems. And I think you would agree that that would represent a material benefit or value. And the causes, we've expanded them to include the, the additional ones that we mentioned. And then the should be, well, for instance, people understand how to do reuse and why it helps them get their jobs done quicker, easier, and better. Okay, and I think if you look at that, uh, you'll agree that uh, that's a it's business language, it's deliverable, you can tell whether or not it's been accomplished, that if delivered or satisfied, it will contribute to achieving the goal measure and thereby providing the, the value. And it's a what, not a how. Many possible ways that how it could be done. 
Similarly, people have meaningful support and encouragement to take the time to make relevant items reusable. Same questions, same answers. Business deliverable what that when delivered contributes to achieving the goal measures and thereby providing the value. And people can easily access, identify, and retrieve relevant reuse items. Okay. And same thing, business deliverable what's that when delivered contribute to achieving the value. Now, hopefully you can see the difference between this revised problem pyramid and the original one. And I think you would agree that this one is far more likely to actually achieve the goal measures and provide real benefit and value. Okay. Now, tying back to what we were saying a minute ago, the real business requirements, okay, I've written them in kind of a generic term, okay, with a little bit of refinement, I think you would all see that these could get written as user stories if you feel that that would be helpful, okay? So user stories should be box five, and too often user stories are box six, and often, too often, for the wrong product, system, or software. So hopefully that's made sense. I know that I went through it quickly, that we contrasted a couple of uh, issues about user stories and features and requirements, okay? and uh, that we've contrasted real business requirements, business deliverable was to provide value when met from product requirements, which are ways how to satisfy the what's, and that if we use these concepts, then we can help us come up with user stories that are forms of real business requirements that actually do provide value. Okay. So just a, a quick uh, summary of some of the stuff that I do. I uh, GoPro Management Incorporated, my firm uh, is in the consulting and training business. We have a variety of uh, courses and consulting. Uh, present one called Writing Right Agile User Story and Acceptance Test Requirements Right. Uh, if you're interested in that, I can work with you directly. Uh, we can work it out to uh, come to you or work uh, online or, or whatever might happen. And I'm delighted to work with you directly. Uh, a little bit more about my background and, and just to let you know that this type of content is the the topic for my forthcoming book on cutting creep, putting business back in business analysis to discover real business requirements for agile ATDD and other project success. And if any of you would like to participate in the drafting of that, I'm always looking for people to to offer some review assistance, especially in the in the early chapters, and share any uh, experiences or, or guidance or anything else. Uh, please email me to participate. Uh, I've uh, hoping to get this uh, on the go in another month or so, and you can contact me at robin at gopromanagement.com. So, Isaac, uh, take it away. Wow, Robin, thank you so much for that. I will grab the ball back and we'll switch into Q&A mode now. And uh, so I'll ask any participants if you have a chance to open up that Q&A panel and type your questions in there. If you can't find the Q&A panel, then you can just simply put them into the chat and we will answer them. I've got a couple of questions teed up. We also have Heidi here as well. So, hi, Heidi. Welcome, I got on. Welcome yeah. back Thank with you us. So <laughs> You're able to join us. Thank you. So, all right, well, let me, uh, Robin, let me start with a question while we keep an eye on, on the Q&A panel and see if any more come in. But let me start with a question for you. The, the pyramid, was awesome, the problem-solving pyramid, that, that was fantastic. 
could you maybe highlight one or two things that you would say to look for to give you that identifier that this is probably the wrong solution? Because I know as you were giving the first example, I, I looked at that and said, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Obviously, that's a project. And in the wild or in real life, what would be those things that we would want to look for to say something here is a bit off, we're not quite ready to roll with this, we need to go back and do a little more digging. What are some of those identifiers that you that you look for when working well, with teams? The, the key is to start with box one, the problem, and then get the current measures that tell us it's a problem and the goal measures that tell us the problem has been solved. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, as I said, it, getting the problem right is much harder and much less common than people assume. And so we have, we have some uh, systematic uh, guide, some guidelines for systematically evaluating it, um, but it gets to uh, do the measures fit? Uh, do we get real value if it's solved? And uh, exactly. so that's the starting point. And most projects start with box six, and frankly, they assume that they know boxes one through five, and then it turns out they don't. Heidi, it yeah, sounded when, like you were joining us. Yeah, yeah, I did. Thank you, and thanks so much. Um, I joined slightly late, but I heard uh, almost all of it. And what I love what you said is that products by themselves provide no value, is that they have to satisfy the business requirements. And I, I know that you already know this, because this is your whole talk, but this is what I see all the time. How do we know that we need it? We haven't really even dug into the business requirement. So um, I think there's a really key area that people should focus on. So thank you. I just wanted to say that. I love that quote. Yeah. And, and the problem is that the premise that a product owner somehow eliminates people's inclinations for not understanding stuff is, is simply not a valid assumption. Uh, no, just because the product owner is involved doesn't mean they get the product right. Doesn't mean they get the their problem right. And uh, and they and in fact, because they're the product owner, and there are no mechanisms for challenging them usually. Um, all things considered, you're probably more likely to go off in wrong directions in an agile environment than you are in in a more traditional one where there might be some reviews. That's excellent. Wonderful, wonderful content. And I know for me, I'm, I'm challenged to go back and revisit some of my uh, targets of what we're trying to do and, and not to, just as you said, you know, what's don't decompose into hows, but recognizing the, the different types of requirements and, and doing the work in such a way that you're going to fulfill them successfully and actually meet some kind of business value. That's, that's very valuable. I see we're coming right up here on about five minutes till, and I want to make sure that we get everybody on to their next meeting in time, if you do indeed have a meeting. So I want to encourage you that if you have a question or something additional, again, you can reach out to Robin, or you can put it in the chat or the QA, and we'll try to gather those and, and maybe do a post-event question. But I do want to let everyone know our next meeting uh, that we'll be having is in March. It's March 27th, and this is going to be an interesting one for us. Uh, Philip Liu is going to be presenting testing in Agile. We'll be talking about how do you get that idea of testing early and often compressed into your working sprint. A lot of times, even if a team is Agile, one of the things they say is, well, we'll do the building, and then we'll still toss it over to the people who do testing. And so Philip is going to share some ideas of how to get the team to really coalesce around working together and getting that testing integrated into the process and how they do it. So that'll be next month, March 27th, and so we hope you'll join us there. So coachingagilejourneys.com, if you have any questions, I do highly recommend Robin's website. While he was talking, I looked it up over here, gopromanagement.com. He's got some articles there on the powerful problem pyramid, which is just excellent. It dives a little bit more into detail on what he was talking about. So if you're interested, I recommend you go and check that out. 
So for let me, all of let us, me, Robin, let me just oh. mention that my Please. website. I I am the ultimate shoemaker's child. My website is woefully unattended. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, articles there, as you as you can say, but I haven't updated the calendar for several years, and I'm. Theoretically, uh, creating a, a revised version, but uh, it's it's excellent. A so visitors, be warned, you might find yourself right. off in the jungle somewhere. Wonderful. Well, again, Robin, thank you so much for being with us. I, I think I speak for everybody who joined today that this was valuable, good reminder for us. Heidi, do you have any closing thoughts? Thank you so much for your time, and I'm definitely going to be reaching out to you about the uh, book review stuff, Robin. Great. Awesome. Okay. Thank, thank right, you, guys. everybody, well, and enjoy next month with Phil Liu. He's one of the good guys. Awesome. awesome. Thank, thank you all. You. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.